Coming up this week on Sporting Journal Radio. An effort to transfer state lands and real properties administered by the DNR to the Red Lake Nation. And the weather forecast being in the 40s and 50s and, and dozens and dozens and dozens of wallets being caught by each angler. Injustice, not justice for all involved. I fish, I hunt, and always will. Broadcasting from the Alclair Outdoor Studios. Presented by OnX. Know where you stand with OnX. <clears throat> We're not just a radio show anymore. This is Sporting Journal Radio. That's right. Welcome to the show. I'm Brett Amundsen. Thanks for tuning in on the network by demand, sportingjournalradio.com. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, thank you very much. That's Dan Amundsen over there. What's up, Dan? Hey. There's Dan. Hi. Right. And David Eckhart, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, hello. Don't look now, but there's a moose right behind you. Right behind me? <laughs> I don't know what you mean, but it had the cadence of a joke. <laughs> yep. So we're going to a rock and roll start. Talk a lot about river fishing this week uh, from the Mississippi to the rainy. We're also going to talk about what's going on at Red Lake. Uh, Robin Dwight is the president of the Upper Red Lake Area Association, and she's going to join us to talk about uh, what's happening up there and what the future could look like with some introduced legislation where uh, Red Lake Nation would get the part of the lake that state residents can use right now. So we're going to, we're going to find out what exactly is going on up there uh, coming up later in the show, plus a Lake of the Woods rainy river update with Joe Henry. But first, ladies and gentlemen, who are the sponsors this week, Dan? This week we have Invergrove Toyota, the official truck sponsor of Fish Hunt Forever is Invergrove Toyota. When looking for your new rig, head over to Invergrove Toyota. Hey, Bell Heights Campground and Resort, fish uh, out of a snow bear in the winter or take a summer trip to Devil's Lake. Learn more at HayBellHeights.com. Onyx Hunt, landowner information, public land access, and much, much more. Know where you stand with Onyx Hunt. Prairie Sportsman, new episode this Sunday, and you could watch other episodes anytime at the Prairie Sportsman YouTube channel. And Lake of the Woods Tourism, can't wait to be up there next weekend. Uh, Lake of the Woods and the Rainy River is the walleye capital of the world. Plan a trip for this spring or summer at lakeofthewoodsmn.com. We should get that switched out so it's not ice fishing. Ice fishing is over. I guess it's that In my time. opinion. Mm-hmm. Some people are still ice fishing Lake of the Woods. They're weird. <laughs> <laughs> right now they're talking about 57 degrees and uh, mostly cloudy skies Tuesday, April 8, uh, 9th, and Wednesday, April 10th, 59 degrees and partly cloudy. So we're going to have some great weather for the two-day fishing tournament, the SGR 500, up there at the Rainy River. It is here. Well, next week it is here. It's almost here. I yeah, guess. I mean, if this airs on the weekend, you know, it's close enough. Why is there a Kane Brown ad on our website? <laughs> What, what have you world? been? What have you been looking up, Dan? Apparently, Whitewater, not Kane Brown. I can promise you that. Well, it's that's your computer. That's how you get those ads. Yeah, well, it's you, based on your search you results. You and I are networked. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> promise you that. Anyway, you can see a video from the tournament last year. You can watch the podcast from the tournament last year at SportingJournalRadio.com and get all the info. We're going to be uh, giving away a whole bunch of prizes. Uh, so it's a $40 entry fee per person. So somebody texted me that uh, signed up for the tournament, said, do we sign up per boat? Is it per person? I said, it's per person. So even if uh, you're in the boat with somebody else, you're competing against that person in the boat. Knock the fish off the net. <laughs> Have some right. skullduggery this year. <laughs> skullduggery. Yes. Uh, so you can uh, win some money back. So we pay back uh, first place walleye, first place sturgeon, get some cash. I think actually second, no wait, first place walleye, first place sturgeon, get cash back. We're also donating money to the Keep It Clean program once again this year. So 25% of the entry fees go to keeping Lake of the Woods and the Rainy River clean for generations to come the sgr 500 it's the third annual we're going to be uh having a rules meeting monday night at riverbend uh, resort on the rainy river and we'll be giving away a bunch of prizes there it's a non-mandatory rules meeting but come on out have a have a beverage uh grab some food we'll give away some prizes and then the tournament goes it's 8 a.m to 4 p.m 
right? 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Tuesday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Wednesday. And then Wednesday night, we will have uh, the podcast. We'll record the podcast once again in the bar. And this year, we're going to go out into the big part of the bar. Uh, Greg Jones is going to be playing live music. So we're going to be utilizing his sound, uh, sound system, his PA system there in the bar. Uh, so even if you're sitting way in the back, you'll be able to hear us loud and clear as we do the podcast. So come be a part of this show right here and maybe win some cash and prizes. Catch some big fish. I'm excited, Dan. You had a buddy just smashing up there. Yeah, Brody Holm was up there. He might. He's uh, kicking around the idea of joining the tournament, and he got some fish dialed in. He said, I, he was by himself. He caught 50, and I think he said 25 of them were over 23 inches. Oh, boy. So, uh, big fish, and guess who's not going to be there? Me. That guy. <laughs> David. <laughs> Loser. Unreal. Yeah. It's a bummer. It's like you knew when this was going to be. Yeah, well. A year ago. Come yeah. on didn't work out it always can work out it's just how hard do you want to try yeah i know how hard do you, how want, hard to, do you yeah. want to stay married yeah exactly. how much do you love That's your wife true. i love her very much well uh enjoy your time wherever you're going uh somewhere uh, south and the no dominican one cares republic. The dominican republic well i'm sure that you'll have fun you know i have i have so little desire to go to like a beach vacation down south somewhere like People always talk about going to Mexico or even, you know, f- even Florida for that. Matter. I mean, I go to Florida and fish around Florida. It'd be a fishing trip, though, not like yeah. a beach vacation. Are you packed yet? I'd probably go to Hawaii, but. Um, no, not packed. Why not? Aren't you leaving like today? Yeah, I'm leaving today. <laughs> <laughs> I don't ever pack till That takes of. like 20 minutes, Dan. So. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, when do you pack? The when night we, before. Nah. Unless I'm leaving in the night, then I'll pack that morning. But like if I had to work and I was going to work, you know, like the podcast, like we're working right now and then leave directly after, I'd probably be packed already. I got like four hours after this. That's oh, then you're of time. Yeah. yeah, plenty of time. As long as your washer doesn't break down. See, think of this. What if you already did my laundry? OK, though? that's good prep. Normally I do my like I do the laundry and then that I don't <laughs> fold it and put it in the dresser. I fold it and put it in my suitcase yeah, or whatever see, that's but all if, i gotta do but if the dryer breaks or something then you're screwed you know that's 20 minutes that's the other thing the beauty of our trip david is uh we're going fishing so really we only need to bring one like one pair of everything for yeah. clothes because we're well, now be, people aren't coming because you're gonna smell bad we're gonna be wearing <laughs> fishing stuff you're gonna have to bring a different change of clothes for every day being out there yeah so five days that's not that much it'll all fit in a little suitcase It'll be just fine. Well, we'll send you snaps of all the big fish we catch up there. I'll be wearing my Sporting Journal Radio sun shirt <laughs> sitting on the beach. There you go. Have a little <laughs> umbrella cocktail. Yep. Not bad. <laughs> a little sangria. Well, we will uh, be enjoying our time up at the Rainy River. We got a little test run of our river gear on uh, Mississippi the other day, Dan. That was kind of it's becoming an Easter tradition for us. Yeah, it's something we do. Um, my dad's nice enough to take us out in his boat. We went down to Red Wing to some, we, we went to, we fished some really secret spots. Yeah. Like there's no other boats there. And it was fun. We caught, <laughs> they're so secret. The fish didn't even know about <laughs> it. We caught fish. Did no, we not? Not in the secret oh, spots. Okay. Well, you're terrible at uh, detecting sarcasm. I yeah. was not being serious. <laughs> well, we tried, well, to be fair, we did try some, you wanted to do some exploring, try some new spots and nobody else was fishing anywhere near any of those places but we got to learn the river a little bit finally we're like screw it let's go to the dam and the entire state of minnesota was fishing at the dam i think yeah and rightfully so i think everyone most people were catching fish i guess we got checked by a couple of conservation officers i didn't catch their names but uh they said it was kind of split some people were catching them some weren't at that point we had not so yeah. hopefully those two are listening to this we ended up catching fish we did catch some we don't suck yeah she's like can we check your live well and i'm like there's nothing in there that's after <laughs> like it's like she didn't believe us that we yeah. didn't have fish like no we don't we haven't caught any it. well can we check the live well okay it's kind of embarrassing like i can open this one up front it's got water bottles in it <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Uh, but yeah, we did. There's like we had like a one forty five minute window where we caught fish down there. And I like if you look, did some Facebook snooping. People caught them that day, like way they better smashed. than we did. Tim Domal was down there. He whacked them pretty good. Um, we caught our shallow. I think he caught his a little deeper. So, it was, you know, maybe we just had that one little window in the middle. It was like twelve thirty. We yeah. picked up, started to pick them up. And maybe I don't know, maybe we hit a minor and that's when our fish went off or. It was just weird. I don't know. Because then, like, we had the 
basically people are using the Iowa fish finder. As soon as our net came out, we were yeah. like swarmed with boats and then our fishing shut down. So the fish were definitely spooky of boats. We didn't really start catching them until we started pitching out from the boat too, which is abnormal for me down there. But the current's low, so you can kind of get away with some of that more fun style fishing. Yeah, we uh, like, we didn't see as many people pitching out like we were, but that's when it turned on. And I did talk to a few other people that were fishing that day, and they saw the same thing. So there's there's definitely a bite window that opened up midday. Um, I'm guessing a lot of people caught them early, and then it probably slowed down a little bit, and then it opened up again there. Yeah, well, there's at least one boat, and I don't know if they had a limit or what their deal was, but you kind of assume when you're getting on the river at 7 and there's a boat coming in with their lights on <laughs> yeah. to pull their boat out, that they probably caught their fish and they're going home to they probably spend that. the day with their wives like good people do. I know. And, and that wasn't and, us. And stay away from the crowd. Because we're not married. But I will say, for as busy as it was... You know, it wasn't bad. Like we we did find a nice little pocket and we spot locked, but you're right. As soon as we caught a couple of fish and the net came out, all of a sudden two boats, maybe you mentioned this, two boats came in and the fishing shut right off. Like they, they kind of sat right where we were casting or kind of bounced through right where we were casting. And that was kind of the end of it for us. But um, fishing all artificial, fishing yeah. plastics. There's my custom bait, David. See that firecracker with a hint of lime? You ever seen that before? <laughs> uh, no, I haven't. Fly. You know how I made that? <laughs> no. So I somehow apparently accidentally stored that firecracker plastic right next to a green one for too long. Yeah, kind of <laughs> sort just of bled over. together. <laughs> yeah. Custom. <laughs> Follow for more custom bait tips. Yeah, leave it in the sun too long. Yep. It worked. Whacked them. <laughs> well, it was a good time down there. If we get a chance to get out and do some fish and do that and plan on being up at the Rainy River with us next week for the SGR 500. Details at SportingJournalRadio.com. And Sunday night, another new episode of Prairie Sportsman is coming uh, to Pioneer PBS, check your local listings for Showtime, Airtime near you. Otherwise, just go to the Prairie Sportsman YouTube channel, too. Uh, you can see the Barrow Trauma episode. That came out last week, by the way. That's available on the Prairie Sportsman YouTube Follow channel. Follow the science. And then this week, uh, I went deer hunting with Danny Thompson. And, man, that guy obviously loves his ice fishing and his Garmin electronics. But if you give that guy a plot of land, he will have food plots on it and water holes and deer walking through there and deer stands he'll have it all designed for you and that's what he breaks down for us how he designed a new piece of land where he put his stands where he put his plots what he planted and all of that see danny's deer this sunday night on pioneer pbs and then a really cool episode i think is the awful watching program episode or segment that we have in that show we're going to tell you what that was when we come back on sporting journal radio 852 million acres of public land, 147 million private properties, all in the palm of your hand. The number one hunting GPS app just got better. With hundreds of custom map layers, 3D and topographic maps, you can easily scout on the road or at home before you go. And now you can get important weather details, CWD detection, and even know what crops have been planted where. Get the most trusted hunting GPS app ever made. Onyx. Know where you stand with Onyx. All right, we're back on Sporting Journal Radio. Thanks for tuning in on the network by demand or watching this on YouTube. I'm Brett Amundsen with Dan Amundsen and David Eckhart. All right, uh, it's new Prairie Sportsman, Sunday night. This is a really cool episode. We talked a little bit about it before the break, uh, but the second half of the show is going to be about the Awful Watching Program or Awful Wildlife Watching Program? Yep. Awful Watching? Awful Wildlife Watching Program. And it's basically what's eating our gut piles out there. And it's pretty interesting because it's all about how deer hunters have essentially created this whole new food source for scavengers in the woods. So it, it's less, I thought maybe it was going to be about, you know, ingesting lead or, or whatever, but it's not, has nothing to do with that. It's it's just what's, what's out there eating it and what effect, like we're watching this video of a skunk feeding on a, a doe carcass right now, and it's chasing off coyotes, which I think is just hilarious. So the awful wildlife watching program gives people cameras or has people sign up uh, with their cameras. You put a camera on your gut pile for 30 days and then you watch it to see what is eating it. And uh, so there's a doe kind of checking out the, the skunk feeding on a deer. And it's all about this new food source essentially for scavengers. So skunks, raccoons, crows, coyotes, whatever is out there um, feeding on these, on these gut piles, they wanna see what, they're, what it is, 
who it is and what effect it's having on the ecosystem. Uh, it's pretty interesting. So you'll be able to watch that this Sunday night on Pioneer PBS or on the Prairie Sportsman YouTube channel or on demand at prairiesportsman.org or check a PBS station near you. That'll probably air uh, sometime in the, in the next couple of months on PBS stations all around the region. We're on like 12, what did I say, 12 PBS stations in seven states. I think with that show, I can never keep it straight. Something like that. <laughs> so I'd like, I like in the read, it's just check your TV guide or yeah. go to YouTube. And I know we're getting added to South Dakota PBS. Is that right? That's uh, brand new. That's just happening. I don't even know if I'm supposed to announce. Wow. That, so. <laughs> Breaking news here. You heard it here first on wow. Sporting Journal Radio. All right, we're going to talk about the Red Lake situation coming up later in the show. Uh, what's going on there? Robin Dwight will join us. Also, Joe Henry will talk about what's happening at Lake of the Woods and the Rainy River here in just a little bit. Uh, and we're going to be riding up there for the SGR 500 in the new Toyota Tundra from Invergrove Toyota. Love this truck. And we're going to have a contest. If you see it, somewhere on the road, park somewhere, take a picture of it, post it and tag us and you'll be entered to win some prizes. I don't know what the prizes are yet. I need to figure that out. <laughs> but if you see the truck and it says fish hunt forever, it's a big blue tundra. It says fish hunt forever on the side, take a picture of it, put it on Instagram, tag fish hunt forever, sporting journal radio, tag us. So we know it's there. Uh, make sure to follow our pages, of course, and you'll be entered to win some prizes. We'll probably, if you, if you do that, we'll probably give you a t-shirt or something. So I got to figure all that out. But if you watch for it, take the picture now. So you have it. So when I announce the prizes, uh, you'll know what it is. And uh, they just got some new Tacomas in, I believe. Uh, if they're not in, they will be in very, very soon. But uh, there's a new 2024 Toyota Tacoma. So if you want something a little bit smaller, and it's built for uh, going off road and taking it on on uh, trips and hunting trips and things like that. A little bit smaller, of course, but uh, they also, which I think is pretty cool, there's going to be a six speed manual option. I don't know if that's new or not. Maybe it's not new, but I think that's pretty cool. Not too many new vehicles still come with a none manual like like hardly any of them it seems like yeah um well, no one knows how to drive them anymore yeah <laughs> including I, myself <laughs> i've been on marketplace just looking for an old toyota with a man like a five speed in it just every day i'm on marketplace looking for old toyota like a uh uh to old corolla or something like that well you should have been looking at the never grove toyota website for oh, a new one. well that's the thing though i i went in and tried to buy i don't remember where i was at or what vehicle but i wanted to buy a little car for mileage and i wanted a five speed or a manual transmission or whatever and they're like a what <laughs> <laughs> We don't make those anymore, sir. It's like, oh. So you almost have to go back or get one of these new 2024 uh, Toyota Tacomas. So uh, check them out, Invergrove Toyota. And when you buy your new uh, Tacoma Tundra, tell them we told you. In fact, you can get 250 bucks off just by going to Sporting Journal Radio and checking out the official truck sponsor of Sporting Journal Radio and Fish Hunt Forever, Invergrove Toyota, and it'll save you some money on your next truck. Right off 494 Robert Street in Invergrove Heights, Minnesota. All right, it's time for a video to watch, ladies and gentlemen. Video of the week. The video of the week. We had a couple of them that we wanted to talk about. Dan, you found um, you found this one with T.J. Erickson. Yeah, he's uh, he actually he quit guiding. He oh, he did be a fishing guide, and it sounds like he's he's not going to be guiding at least as much anymore. And he's going into more of the content creation world. He's been making YouTube videos for a little bit, and uh, he was up on the Rainy River, and so of course naturally this time of year it catches my eye, and he uh, kind of broke down where how he found fish currently. And I think that's always fun to watch because you, you search Rainy River videos, you always get something from last year or a couple of years ago, and there's always still good info in that, but things are changing. The water levels are different this year where we've got less flow. So it's always fun to get up-to-date reports. So I figured that was one people should check out, especially because our tournament's coming up. People, are, it's going to be a busy weekend up at the Rainy River. Um, so there's some tips for you to look to check. Of course, it's river fishing. Fish move in the river faster than you find them. So things might be different. So don't like uh, trash TJ if you use his tips and you don't catch fish. Maybe you suck or maybe the fish move. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's good stuff. It's always fun to get up to date information. And of course, if you can always get information from our show too. But That's right. uh, it's always fun to go and watch a bunch of videos and check some different things out. And TJ had a lot of good stuff. TJ is a smart angler. He's got a lot of lot of cool tips and tricks on on fishing, especially in northern Minnesota. So uh, always interesting to see what he's up to. I use using a hair jig. Yeah, people love it. You know, people love hair jigs. Like I made a video the other day, a couple weeks ago now, I guess it was about like my top three uh, 
river spring river walleye baits and someone literally said he's like i think it's against the law or a sin to not include the hair jig in oh, this. Yeah. <laughs> not kind of i mean you're not wrong hair jigs yeah. are good i just don't fish them a ton mm-hmm. yeah i heard they ever use them no i haven't i've never really had like a banner day on a hair jig and i think i just need to have one good day where i catch a couple nice fish on them and then like hair jigs are the greatest thing yeah, in the yeah, world but, tackle box full of them yeah but until i do i have like three of them in there and i look at them and they get all kind of gross and rusty and like, <laughs> Ugh, it's I mean, kind of time it on. It makes sense. I, I last time I actually targeted smallmouth and fish for them, like try to try to catch smallmouth. I was using hair jigs, and I had a bunch of hair jigs, and I was doing it. But I don't think of them for walleyes very often. You should like, anything apparently anything. I think you you catch smallmouth or anything with yeah. a walleye is going to bite. Absolutely. So that's one of the things we've learned the last few years. Well, thank you, TJ. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, we'll link to that video in our description here, in our video right here. And then the other one was. Jason Mitchell uh, weighing in on the forward facing sonar debate. And uh, he goes, he talks at length, kind of talks about uh, how he feels about that. So if you want to learn a little bit more, there's been a lot of people, kind of uh, some of the uh, bigger names in the fishing industry weighing in on the forward facing sonar debate lately, it seems, Dan. Yeah, there definitely are. And uh, I think it's it's one of those things that's not going to go away either. The discussion, I mean, I mean, you're going to see different you're going to see different people do different things with forward facing sonar, but he brings up a lot of good points of uh, why it is the way it is and how it is. Speaking of which, we forgot to mention this earlier, but <laughs> David doesn't like to buy stuff. He likes to build it. Yeah, I had all I had to buy for that was the clamps. So I had everything else. This is your live scope mount custom. Yeah, works great for a John boat. It'll clamp over a four inch side, but not great if you've got a fiberglass with thick sidewalls this i think is the best part honestly right here because with the one that i had that fits into i've got the ram mount but it goes into the rod holder yep and then it flexes way too much so this your live scope pole is going through here right? yeah yep. yeah and that's keeping so it, it from moving it hooks the current won't spin it yeah that's a, can you build me one by tomorrow <laughs> before you leave for the dominican yeah. the next please? four hours that would be great well you're not packed yet so if you can pack, <laughs> if you can pack so that's quickly right. you probably could build one of those just as quick so what would you do differently if you if you built uh, another one of these not use half inch aluminum plate <laughs> no, not, yes you would yeah Don't you would a uh, quarter inch would be fine still probably too heavy H- <laughs> hd eights. david over here <laughs> Uh, very cool. All right, and uh, you found a reel for us. Here's a reel to watch. Reels to watch for. The rabbit hole of reels continues. Reels to watch for. The reason I like to make David do it. Sorry, David, I stole your thunder there for a minute. But <laughs> That's fine. Because uh, we're in a, a group where we send reels to it, and it's always like David has seen all of them before <laughs> any of us. So I always like to make David the expert. On reels to watch. Yes. So this one came from Sydney Wells. It looked like they were doing some crappie fishing or bass fishing and trying to get a cool drone shot and didn't work out so well i just want to point out before we played this that i saw this before you oh so i, I saw win the, the game i saw it last Sick week burn yeah. i saw it like two weeks ago whatever well fine then yeah, Either so, way. Well, that's, that's because dan <laughs> stalks <laughs> Nope, I don't think they do. That's a does it float? <laughs> it's not a cheap mistake. <laughs> Who do you blame oh, there? The the pilot or yeah. the angler? Nobody really to blame there. It's just an well, accident. There's someone to blame. There, yeah, for sure. Dan would blame me, um, no matter if I was fishing or flying the drone. It'd be my fault. Yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, that's something where you'd have to have the discussion ahead of time. All right, all right. You're gonna cast, and I'm gonna fly this drone, and then I mean, if you're casting, you have to be a little bit aware. Of, it, it would all depend what was set up ahead of time before right. you could. Before you could cast blame. See what I did there? <laughs> cast blame. All right. Uh, we're going to talk Rainy River and Lake of the Woods with Joe Henry in uh, just a couple of minutes. And then Red Lake, Upper Red Lake, um, there is uh, some legal stuff going on with uh, Upper Red Lake and what Red Lake Nation was is trying to do. So we're going to get the lowdown from Robin Dwight coming up later on Sporting Journal Radio. 
Devil's Lake is legendary, and this summer has been legendary for walleyes. Don't miss out. Call Haybell Heights Campground and Resort today to book one of their modern cabins on East Bay. The cabins are furnished with a full bathroom, kitchen, and all the amenities like high-speed internet and are clean following CDC guidelines. Staying at Haybell Heights gives you full access to a private boat launch, fish cleaning station, and beach area. Learn more at haybellheights.com. That's haybellheights.com. Plan your trip to legendary Devil's Lake today. All right, this is Sporting Journal Radio. Thanks for tuning in and joining us here on the show. We're going to talk Lake of the Woods and the Rainy River with Joe Henry from Lake of the Woods Tourism right now. Joe, how's it going? I, Brett's going good. You know, I'm glad you included the Rainy River when you mentioned Lake of the Woods because I think it's uh, based on the reports we're getting right now in real time with two weeks left through April 14th and the weather forecast being in the 40s and 50s and, and dozens and dozens and dozens of walleyes being caught by each angler. I think it's probably pretty appropriate. This is a time when somebody says, all right, man, hey, if they really start rolling, maybe maybe give me a buzz. I think now is the time to give somebody a buzz. Yeah, for sure. I know uh, it, it's one of those things every year. You know, we have our tournament coming up there, and we we're, we thought this year might be a little bit different, that people might sign up early because of the, the warmer weather we had. And then, of course, we had that late – Arctic blast roll through with all the snow and cold temps and kind of slowed down the thaw a little bit. Um, but it's one of those things. It's almost like, okay, it, it's on. You, we got to leave tomorrow type of thing. And uh, it seems like the, the hot bite is now. And obviously now through the rest of the season, I think it'll be it'll be game on up there, it seems like, Joe. But it's, almo- it's almost hard to plan for, you know? Oh, it's totally hard. It's, it's a timing thing. And one thing about the spring bite, you almost just have to plan on going up. In fact, it was really ironic. I had a a good buddy of mine who I, I fish a couple of tournaments with from St. Uh, St. Cloud area. Uh, his name is Nick New. He owns the Line X in St. Cloud. And Nick, uh, he had plans to go with a couple of buddies up to the Rain River this past weekend. And my gosh, he still went, even though there was ice on the river. So <laughs> there were not a lot of boats on the river this past weekend because it was still, you know, it had opened up and then it froze over again because of really cold overnight temps for a couple of weeks there. But these boats broke broke ice, and they were sitting out there amongst icebergs. And I will tell you what, uh, he was rewarded with his personal best walleye of over 31 inches. So, wow. I mean, they didn't catch a lot of fish. Now, I will say this. Since then, it's been in the 40s. The river has opened up drastically. I mean, it's, it's really opened up so quickly. There's a, a picture of Nick with the ice around him and his big 31. But, you know, uh, it's now opened up drastically, and... A lot more boats are out, you can imagine, and they are catching fish. We're getting reports of good good numbers of fish. In fact, Danny, didn't you didn't you have a buddy just up there? Yeah, my buddy Brody. That's his picture there on the on the screen there. He said he was up uh, the other day by himself and he caught uh, fifty, and I believe he said he had twenty five over twenty three inches. So wow, I mean that's Jeez. just that, what a day, huh? What a day. Well, and you know I think the the word is they're getting some big fish. But the word on the street is a lot of those big fish from the lake, those huge females, the, the, the 28, 29, 30, 31, 32 varieties, inch varieties, they're not quite there yet. And I mm. think that they might be coming in from the lake yet. So with the temps in the forecast, that could very easily happen. You know, for for, for listeners that don't know, uh, our spring season for walleye fishing is open through April 14th. So when we say we got a couple of weeks left, the clock is a ticking. It's always a timing thing, but our weather forecast looks just awesome. It's in the 40s and 50s, and, and you know, on the 14th, well, it, it even touches 60 throughout there. So mm-hmm. it's going to be good. Uh, it's going to heat up quick. Um, once we, once those walleyes get some sun on them, you know, I think the, the, the bite's going to improve even more. So it could be really a fun spring. And the other thing I should mention, too, is sturgeon. You know, sturgeon season is open. It, it teeters back and forth between a catch and release and a keep season this spring, but but I tell you, if you want to go catch a dinosaur, th- there's as many walleye anglers hooking dinosaurs right now accidentally using jigs and minnows as there is you know, anglers actually fishing for sturgeon. So it's just a fun time. It's a neat time, and it's one of the only games in town, that's for sure. You know, I'm still going up there for walleye first, but I think what you're starting to see is just as many sturgeon anglers going up there. And I'll be honest, I mean, you go up there to catch that, that fat 30-incher, uh, for sure. I mean, numbers are great. <clears throat> uh, catching numbers of slot fish are awesome, but it's all catch and release. So you're not up there trying to catch eaters. You're up there trying to catch a trophy, of, of course. And uh, man, if you can if you can get a crack at maybe one of those big, big walleyes and then also go after like a 60, 70 pound sturgeon on the same trip, 
I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I still want to go up there for walleyes, but I'm I'm excited to do some sturgeon fishing while I'm up there, Joe. Hundred percent. Well, and you know, there, the, you know, amongst the walleye anglers is a there's a club, and you know, they call it the Dirty Dirty Thirty Club, right? Mm-hmm. And that means you've caught a walleye over thirty inches. And you know, if a person really wants, I tell my buddies, and I kid around, but I, I'm kind of not kidding around when I say it. It's almost like a Forrest Gump quote, I think. You know, I tell my buddies that hey, you know what the secret of catching a monster walleye is? <laughs> Fishing a body of water that has a lot of monster walleyes. And I'll tell you, when you get all these big walleyes constricted into the small rainy river you have a very good chance of catching a, a truly a walleye of a lifetime get a couple of good picks and get that fish back nice and safe and that's the name of the game you know you talk about uh the whole well, it's sturgeon. funny before we get into sturgeon joe i just mentioned i just want to mention it's funny that you say that because i've been editing the new prairie sportsman episode that's about to come out uh, this week and in it, I have a 30 inch walleye from Lake of the Woods. So I've been looking That's at what you a, got last summer. Yeah, I've been looking at a 30 inch walleye from Lake Sick of the Woods all week. Brag, bro. I'm pretty good at this. <laughs> I'm pretty awesome no at fishing. Cares. Yeah, it's, well, no one cares. Wasn't, cool. wasn't that the walleye that you were using? Like, did, didn't you see it come behind your your uh, your spinner with forward facing sonar? You had to point it backwards. Is that right? Yeah, so I was riding in the back of the boat, back of Dan's boat with my uncle, and uh, Dan was up front, and we were working uh, one of the reefs out there, and uh, using two live scopes with one pointed backwards, I could watch my bottom bouncer, and as we were, you know, 30 feet behind the boat, and then as we we would approach any sort of structure or, or changes in bottom, I could lift and watch my bottom bouncer so I could stay in contact with the bottom, not get hung up, not get snagged. I could lift up over, you know, rocks or whatever else is down there on the bottom. And uh, I did see a big mark on that live scope right before I caught that 30 inch fish. I'd, I'd assume it was the same one. You never really know up at Lake of the Woods and that, you know, there were some nice fish getting caught all around us. And right before I caught that one, another slot fish, I think, in our boat. So uh, it, I think it was the same one. That's the way I like to think about it, but it's hard to say. But uh, could yeah, you, it was, when you were doing that, it was neat. just out of curiosity, could you see fish coming behind it? Like, could you see fish chasing your spinner? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I love, like, uh, I love having a live scope in the, if we're pulling spinners, I love having a live scope in the back. I did that all summer last year. And uh, once I did it for the first time at Lake of the Woods, I was like, I want to try this, see if this will work. And especially when, you know, with a two or three ounce bottom bouncer on there, that's a pretty big profile to see on the live scope. And uh, sure enough, I could I could follow. In fact, uh, a lot of times if there was two of us back there pulling spinners, I could see both spinners on the live scope and you could see fish coming in and and reacting to it. Now, that one, I didn't see that one come and hit it because the boat was kind of turning to go around the structure a little bit. But I did I did mark the fish before it ate. So, uh, yeah, it's a fun way. If you're pulling spinners, you could definitely utilize live scope to see how the fish are reacting. So, Danny, when you were uh, when you're up at the Rainy River last year, did you use live scope on the river? No, I didn't have it. I think Brett might have had it, but I don't right. think we use it a whole lot. I don't no, think I, I didn't have it set up yet. No, I used it. David did. Yeah. Yeah, you did. How, how, yeah. how does it work on the river? It worked great. So we just pointed the boat um, in the direction of the current and just used the trolling motor just to keep us straight. And then it was basically like vertical jigging. You were just drifting with the current. So your jig was straight down. So the fish were right underneath you. So it was real easy to keep your jig in sight. And yeah. It was actually pretty frustrating because you'd see 10 to 1, you know, 10 fish would come look at it before one would hit it. It was a little bit tougher that day. But, yeah, it was like, oh, there's one. Oh, there there it goes. (laughs) (laughs) You're giving Joe a lot of tips to beat us with his (laughs) brand new live scope this weekend. Maybe were you using down scan or were you actually using it uh, shooting off to the side? Um, I had it in forward um, looking straight in front of us. So I could see if there was a log or something coming, I'd be able to lift over it. And, uh, oh, so the current was pushing debris. stuff to you, and you just watched uh, the, the the fish or the logs or whatever, the debris coming down towards the boat? Yep. Yeah, we were just... Because you had it on, had it on your own motor. No, we had it off the side of the boat. You did? Okay. Yeah, they had one on each side yeah, of the boat. we had you one on Scott, each side of the boat. Which I end up doing as well, but I think that was the first time I'd used mine in open water, so I was figuring it out. I don't know if I used it the first two days. Well, but. and we probably didn't have the right mounting gear for that boat either, so no. we probably <laughs> Jimmy, <laughs> Jiggy, Jimmy Riggin live scope. I think I had a bungee yeah, cord you know, the we, side We of the spend boat. the thousands of dollars for the live scope, but we <laughs> can't buy the extra two or $20 mount to get it set well, up. You know, that, that, bungee, that bungee cord cost you five bucks, didn't it? Yeah, it worked. And I've seen sturgeon on it, so we used it when I was sturgeon fishing, and... uh 
so I was able to see some, in fact, I think we got some kind of some cool footage of these giant sturgeon and then fighting a sturgeon on a live scope. So it's, you know, uh, I'll, I'll say this, you know, right, right, wrong or indifferent, it, the technology's here and there's a fair number of people using it more and more every year. Right. And, you know, I, uh, I'm just fascinated by the fish talk that we, the conversations we get into about what, what we see down below and how the fish are reacting. And even David's saying, yeah, it was frustrating seeing 10 fish yeah. to, to pitching one. I mean, who would have known? Doesn't that? make them bite. Doesn't make them bite. Just helps you find them. All right, Joe, um, we're looking forward to it. I know you're going to be up there next week to the SGR 500, the third annual, uh, April 9th and 10th. You can sign up through Fish Donkey. It's a two-day walleye and sturgeon fishing tournament. All the details at sportingjournalradio.com. And if people want to plan a trip to the Rainy River or Lake of the Woods this summer, what should they do? You know what? Uh, either check our Facebook page out for real-time info. Otherwise, our uh, our website, and that is lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Northern Minnesota's Walleye Factory is a year-round world-class fishing destination. The perfect getaway this summer is just a short drive to Lake of the Woods. Fish Big Traverse Bay, the Rainy River, or visit the unique Northwest Angle. To catch big fish, you have to go where the big fish are. Plan your trip to Lake of the Woods at lakeofthewoodsmn.com. That's lakeofthewoodsmn.com. All right, we're back on Sporting Journal Radio. Thanks for watching or tuning into the radio network. I'm Brett Amundsen along with Dan Amundsen and David Eckhart. And there is uh, something going on up in northwest Minnesota, Upper Red Lake, that we wanted to uh, learn a little bit more about. So Robin Dwight joins us right now, uh, the president of the Upper Red Lake Area Association. Robin, thanks for coming on the show. Well, thanks for inviting me. Happy to be here. Real quick, uh, I noticed um, that last time I think we had you on, we were talking about the keep it clean effort. And uh, obviously that's been, there's the, the hoodie right there. Very nice. How's that been going for you up there? Uh, we had a very successful year, uh, thanks to legislation put in place last year to prohibit garbage and waste on ice. And all of the businesses at Upper Red Lake and all of the community members uh, did a great job of uh, just keeping the, ma- the lake immaculate, providing resources for all of our visitors to do the right thing. And we will continue that as long as we're able to. Did you notice a difference then with that new legislation? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Good. Well, this was a unique year because of the weather. So we didn't have as many people out for early ice. But later on, the traffic picked up and uh, people knew what was expected of them. We did a huge campaign, a geofencing campaign. We've had lots of posters, lots of materials. Just We just have been slamming people with that message and they've been responding in a very positive way. And my goodness, for the people that did go out there and fish, uh, looked like they had a pretty good winter up there. Yeah, not to mention the crappies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I saw some a lot of really nice crappies come out of that lake this year. Well, and go yeah. back in, I should say. But uh, yeah, you I know, know it was, uh, yeah, and there's a great year class of crappies coming up, and the walleye fishery is healthy. So it's just uh, we're looking forward to the summer opener now. Yeah, and I, I know the, the fish, I mean, it's a great fishery, of course, and uh, it was really good this year, which is maybe why a, a lot of the news that's coming out right now, oh yeah, Dan fished there. Was yeah, la- right after opener. Last yeah. year. That was probably one of my better days of the year. That's right. It was fun. I think that's why some people are a little uh, worried about the the recent news about what's going on up there. And Robin, maybe you can just update us with what exactly the situation is right now. Well, I guess I, from my understanding, the legislation that was introduced was um, an effort to transfer state lands and real properties administered by the DNR to the Red Lake Nation uh, with a $20 million appropriation to um, help that effort be successful. And the details are uh, online. You can check them out on our website or you can go to the legislative website. The bill number is House File 4780 and the Senate file is 5080. Uh, It has not been heard in committee yet. So there are a few unknowns about what will actually happen over the next few weeks um, and in the long term. So for us, we were completely blindsided. Our community rallied together and said, what is happening here? We reached out to as many of our representatives um, and people everywhere, DNR, you name it, uh, to find out if they knew what was going on. And it seemed that uh, there wasn't a lot of information people could share with us. So we started to put together 
a real group of concerned citizens to get to the bottom of what the bill was all about, why it was introduced by um, a representative and senator that don't even represent our district, uh, why our own county commissioner didn't even know much about it, and um, what would be the result of the bill to the people who live in this community. There didn't seem to be a great explanation about uh, how the people who live here would be impacted and what our compensation might be in all of this. I'm finding uh, that that's happening a lot right now, that a lot of people are making decisions for people that that live in other parts, you know, and I'm not talking about just Minnesota. I'm talking about all over the place. It's happening. Uh, and, and there's just some head scratching uh, legislation being introduced out there. So this this one would essentially that would take uh, a mile boundary around the state owned portion of Upper Red. Is that essentially what it what it means? And that seems to be what we understand, although we haven't had any feedback from the bill authors to date um, officially. So I'm hoping that will change. I do have a meeting with Representative Sydney Jordan on Friday at between 8 and 8.15. So I'll talk fast and I'll have my questions prepared. And I hope we get some understanding of the purpose of the bill and, and the, what the impacts intended impacts will be. So I can't answer that question for you right now. So what do you get about 15 minutes to talk to him? Is that at this meeting? Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so if if that were the case, what does that mean for your area? What does that mean for your community if that were to happen? Uh, well, I live within 1 mile of the lake. Our association members all live within one mile of the lake. Most of our business owners rely on the um, tourism from the lake. Um, so everything that happens within one mile of the lake is ingrained in our culture, in our society, in our community. We have people that have lived here for six, seven generations. And although I completely um, acknowledge the importance of addressing historical injustices and promoting the rights of Indigenous peoples, I have to say that um, our rights are not being even considered in some sort of a solution that appears more to me to be injustice, not justice, for all involved. Well, maybe this is a better question for, for a lawyer, but they're, so they're disputing uh, a map or uh, the results of uh, a treaty agreement from a long time ago? It's more than that. I mean, the history goes back a long way, and there have been a lot of injustices done, and there have been a lot of grievances, and um, this has been litigated over the years. Um, some of the documents um, imply that the litigation was completed for the last time a few decades ago. I don't know that to be the case, um, but well, I so, don't uh, feel. So this is this has been been uh, this has gone to court before then. This mm -hmm. essentially the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, similar similar concerns about um, who is the rightful owner of the lake. Um, not necessarily all the forest land, but so this is a little bit of a different situation right now because it's about the state forests as well. And um, we know what a loss we would have in our county if we were no longer able to access the resources in the state forest here. Um, we have PILT money that helps support our school district. We have CONCON -con money that goes to our county. Um, we don't have any answers as to what will happen economically to Beltrami County and our community if uh, the authors achieve what they're hoping to achieve with this legislation. And we're unclear about what they hope to achieve also. So one mile of Lakeshore, so that is it include some private ownership, or some state ownership. Is yeah. there fe federal ownership in there at all? Um, not so sure about federal ownership, but this, this land in, in question has an intermixing of state land, tribal land, private land. There may be some federally controlled property in there as well. You've got the map up there. So it's not just as simple as saying uh, we can just, you know, draw a line around this and, and make some changes. We've got uh, people that live in the state forest and so access is a question. We've got um, a public access that's controlled by the DNR that if it were closed to the public, that totally chokes off our economy for people getting onto the water. 
Uh, we have a park there, a homestead park, which we've enjoyed for generations. And it's not just our enjoyment of these resources, but we've invested in them. We have organizations and groups that have worked to protect our environment, our waters and our forests, not only state agencies and local organizations, but we've worked cooperatively with the Red Lake Nation on many projects over decades. So I can give you the Keep It Clean um, program, for example. We've had meetings where we have Red Lake tribal members at our meetings because they've been involved with this Keep It Clean program from the very beginning. Hmm. This would include the state park too, Big Bog State Park. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's that's part mm-hmm. of it in there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I, I thought I read somewhere, and I I apologize. I I uh, you know there's been so much information out there, but I thought I read somewhere too that if this does happen, that um, state residents or non-tribal members would still be able to utilize that portion of the lake. Um, well, they, they always could. I mean, no one was ever barred from using the entire lake. It's public property. Everybody gets to enjoy the forests, the parks, the trails, the lake. Um, The two-thirds of Upper Red Lake is tribally owned. And so I hope everyone respects those boundaries and understands that um, the public does not go there. Right. Uh, But but I'm saying that that if this does happen, that you'd still be able to use the lake. But if if you don't, if there's no public accesses anymore, it'd be hard to get on you know, you, you're not guaranteed to be able to get on the water at that point, right? There's no guarantee what will happen if this legislation is passed, because if things return to the Red Lake Nation, they're a sovereign nation who make their own laws. And um, we will not have any, um, you know, bargaining power or any sort of um, voice in how those laws are determined. So what can people do if they want to... Um you know, voice a concern or be, you know, be a part of this situation, what can they do? Well, we have a website designer who we just hired to um, bring our website into the new millennium. He's done a fabulous job. So you can go to our website. It's a long name. It's the Upper Red Lake Area, ASSN.com. We'll Upper Red Lake Area Association.com. Yeah, and you could put a link up there. That would help. I think if you Google Upper Red Lake Area Association, you'll find the website. We also have a very active um, Facebook page, and um, our, our Upper Red Lake Association has an active Facebook page where we invite questions and comments, and we share information with the understanding to all the people that are on our website that we will absolutely not allow any racial or political slurs and that we reserve the right to remove any comments that are inflammatory, no matter who's saying it. Um, so sometimes that slips because the website administrators are busy, um, but we ask that you please respect each other when you're having these conversations. We also have another very popular fishing uh, Facebook page called the Real Upper Red Lake Fishing Report. They have, um, I think, maybe 20 to 30,000 people view their website, and they they share information there as well. Um, Right now, we're planning to go to the Capitol on April the 5th for a public lands day event being held not by us, but we're welcome to join and stand Uh, beside them in the rotunda and I think their event starts at three o'clock and so we have a group of people that are going to be going to the capitol and holding some signs and taking a little fact sheet with us so um, so we know what the priorities are that we want to share with the press or with whoever else is there that wants to listen to you know learn a little bit about what's happening up north Mm -hmm. and then we also have I shouldn't forget to let you know that we have a uh, town hall meeting coming up on April the 20th in the city of Kellyer, and that's being hosted by the Upper Red Lake Area Association. And that's in response to the massive numbers of phone calls and emails that I have personally been receiving because I'm the president of our 501 um, nonprofit group up here um, asking what we can do. And, and I said, well, the first thing we should do is have a meeting, uh, to open transparent meeting um, so that we can meet with legislators meet with people who can give us some real solid answers about this and help us with a path forward to know what we can do to um, to stop what we believe is unfair, divisive, and destructive legislation. Yeah, and I see that there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of the state representatives 
are uh, are getting involved in this too. It's um, it's a big deal, and I, I wish you luck. Obviously, we would hate to see access uh, uh, denied access denied to the upper red that we've been enjoying for so long. And obviously, the people that have invested in that community that would be uh, uh, pretty detrimental to their to their their lives and what they've been they've done their entire lives and their businesses and and everything there. So, um, Robin, uh, good luck with everything. Uh, we'll link below the website uh, and we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. And if there's anything else, uh, we can help. And it's and I, I think it's important that this is a civil discussion. Like you mentioned, uh, uh, people on social media are idiots most of the time and, uh, <laughs> you know, can can get out of control with language and finger pointing and name calling. It's uh, it's time to be civil and all of this. But um, we you know, hopefully the right things right things happen. So, uh, Robin, good luck with everything. And uh, anything else you want to say about it? I just appreciate you helping us share our message and uh, I guess we'll just stay tuned and see what the legislators at St. Paul and um, in Washington decide to do about all of this. It's an interesting time right now. Uh, Robin Dwight, president of the Upper Red Lake Area Association. Thanks for the time on the show. Thanks, Brett. Sporting Journal Radio is a division of Macaba LLC. If you've got a question, comment, or story idea for us, send us an email. Go to sportingjournalradio.com. While you're there, you can learn how to advertise on the show and visit our store for hats, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. Go to sportingjournalradio.com.